who is it you think of when it comes to Borderlands' best character? The one that if you had to choose represented Borderlands as a whole. Krieg, the psycho with disassociative identity disorder, a once normal man driven to insanity with his conscience still intact but locked behind the violent nonsensical ramblings of a psycho, against all odds someone like him still managed to find a home, people who accepted him for who he is, all while falling in love. What about Tina, the teenage explosives expert battling with loneliness as we watched her tackle and take on the stages of grief before our very eyes? popular enough to warrant getting her own spin-off game. How about Handsome Jack, the iconic villain so well written you could argue him being the true hero of the story. While those are good options and you could make a solid argument in their favor for why they or any other character you fancy are great, I'm actually not here to convince you who's the best character. But there's one common theme amongst all of the best. And that is a sad and tragic story. And no other character has had nearly as many depressing storylines given to them and I think truly represents Borderlands as a whole as Claptrap. Time and time again across the different games, comics, and whatever other medium he appears in, it just seems like he's always given some kind of sad yet meaningful story. Yet despite it all, and however many times he goes through it, fans always just see him as the joke-cracking, robot-dancing, dubstep-spitting robot he is on the surface. It's almost as if he never goes through any actual character development to the point that it's acknowledged. But if you take a second to stop and look at him really, you'll find a very heartfelt, good-natured individual who at the end of the day is simply looking for friends. So, I wanted to cover all the times Claptrap has had these meaningful stories and highlight this aspect of his character because I think it's actually quite important to the world of Borderlands. Now the first game doesn't have much going on in terms of anything. Borderlands 1 narratively suffers from pretty much everything. It's a bare bones world and story, but it was overflowing with character. The individual personality shone through what was an otherwise very bleak and dull landscape. Nothing much quite happens within the game itself in regards to the characters. But you can say this is where the building blocks for everyone's personalities stemmed from. Pretty much every game afterwards built upon and used what happened in this story to better progress its cast of characters. Claptrap, for example, largely just greets you. You repair him when he gets shot, and from that point onward, he's mostly there telling you about missions available at the bounty board. From the outsider's perspective, it's a very casual interaction. Of course, from this game moving forward, we would know the association Claptrap has with these characters, but you wouldn't expect such a simple interaction to wind up meaning so much to him, but it did. You know when there was that vault monster scare? I had these friends, and boy, times sure were scary. But I didn't care, because I had friends, and they were like super friends, and then they left me. But they saved the world, and I was like, I know those guys! Even though they didn't come back after that, I, I still knew they cared, because no one had ever been nice to me before. What is this? My eye is, like, leaking. In his own words, Roland, Lilith, Mordecai, and Brick were apparently the first group of people ever nice to him. Now, to be fair, that dialogue was from the pre-sequel, where his personality had already been well established by that point. Borderlands 2 was where the writers first began really contrasting Claptrap's emotions and making him the butt of the joke. He was no longer the robot helping you out, he was the character everyone hated and wanted nothing to do with. His overly optimistic, happy, and upbeat tone of voice was the perfect setup to make a depressing character. On more than one occasion, he addresses just how sad he is. In the beginning of the game, he even tells you directly, If I sound pleased about this, it's only because my programmers made this my default tone of voice! I'm actually quite depressed! Oh, but that Claptrap, he's such a kidder. Despite what you might expect, I don't think Claptrap's true character payoff this game is delivered during the main narrative itself, rather, a side mission. Claptrap's birthday bash is such a depressing insight into what it's like to be him. It's been seven years since he first rolled off the assembly line, and so he decides to celebrate by throwing a party for himself and inviting a few friends. Scooter, Moxie, and Marcus are all given invitations, but decline to show up. 
The only ones who do are us, the Vault Hunters. We dance, drink, blow the party noise thing, and eat pizza. We celebrate Claptrap's depressingly lonely birthday with him and only him. While throughout the party, he vocally seems to express his disappointment in the turnout. Well, uh, I think that about wraps it up. Thanks for, um, thanks for coming to my party, Minion. It, uh, it looks like I love way too much pizza. So, uh, take some home if you want. By the end of everything, he claims it was the best birthday he's ever had. That was the best party I've ever thrown! Sad? Yeah. But honestly, it makes sense. It wasn't too long ago that Claptrap began making friends. His birthdays prior to this were probably just himself. But this time, at least six Vault Hunters showed up, the main characters of Borderlands 2. So yeah, a few people didn't make it, but he got to celebrate it with his minions, and it probably was his most successful party. There's a reason he refers to everyone as friends. They may not realize or appreciate it to the extent that he does, because he's annoying, he ruins everything, haha, <laughs> he's the butt of the joke, but from Claptrap's perspective, they mean a lot more to him than they realize. But because Claptrap is and acts the way that he does, we often don't react in a very sympathetic or heartfelt way towards him. It's not just how the characters treat him, but the audience as well. The writers have done this weirdly successful thing where they make the player feel as if they're in on the joke. So they laugh at Claptrap's misery instead of feeling bad and sympathizing for him. And if you want an example, then take a look at Tiny Tina's assault on Dragon's Keep. The whole story is about Tina's grief of losing Roland and how important he was to her. At the end of the campaign, they all visit Roland's grave, and there's this moment. And in the days to come, they'd think of their fallen friends, of the adventures they shared, both real and imaginary. And they'd remember that no matter how bad things got, they were never truly alone so long as they had each other. I love you guys. Oh. Why did you cry? And then Claptrap said something stupid and ruined everything. Again, Claptrap's emotions are played for laughs. Tina and everyone else are allowed to grieve for their friend, but somehow Claptrap ruins the moment. Roland was just as much of a friend to him as all of them. And all Claptrap is doing is expressing his gratitude for being part of such a group. He considers them all his friends and he wants them to know it, but they all make fun of him. Can you imagine if they did this with Tina? Somehow they've successfully created this shield where sympathy isn't the initial reaction you give Claptrap. The audience happily indulges in being like the characters and putting him down. But, to be fair, the pre-sequel made an actual canonical reasoning for why the characters might do this. Borderlands the pre-sequel decided to take things even further. Of course, narratively, it takes place before Borderlands 2, but it was developed after. So they took that optimistically depressed character he shone as and continued building on it. I already played the clip where he was recounting the events of the first game and how he considered that group his first friends, but if you start looking at his dialogue more, you'll see that seems to have opened the floodgate in who he considers friends. If such a simple association to characters led to him forming such a strong outlook on them, then you can imagine what going on an actual mission and adventure would be like to someone like Claptrap. The likes of Athena, Wilhelm, Nisha, Timothy, and Aurelia, he came to consider his friends. Time to help my friends! You want me to join you? I am so excited! We will be best friends! Until we meet again on the battlefield, friendo! We're best friends! Ah, Way to leave me hanging, friend! <laughs> I just want to be loved! I am right behind you, vault hunting friend! Now perhaps all of those dialogues are just what he does when he tries to make friends, which is why people might find him a bit too straightforward, but that's not it. The true insight in the Claptrap psyche comes literally in the form of the pre-sequel's only DLC, 
the Claptastic Voyage. Apparently, something known as the H Source is located within Claptrap's mind, and Jack wants to retrieve it so he can make Hyperion a real threat. So all of the Vault Hunters are sent into Claptrap's head where we get to see him in his most vulnerable. We've never really known why Claptrap is so hated by the in-universe characters. There's some bullet points, but it's always been kinda just that. But here we do get an insight into the general problems that seem to face him from his perspective. At one point in time, Claptrap began living in the town of Overlook. Jack was holding a Vault Hunter Gladiator competition, and Claptrap, being the robot he is, simply wanted to help out. He was put in charge of fireworks for the halftime show, but he didn't just want to do his job. He wanted to go above and beyond to really impress everyone. So he instead opted to use explosives, as he thought they would create a bigger explosion. They did but it sent the entire arena careening into the ocean. Overlook was smashed up pretty badly. Some competitors were recovered and sent to heal in the town church. Of course, everyone blamed Claptrap for the disaster and was upset with him, but they were still willing to accept that it was an accident and give him a second chance. So once again, Claptrap tried to help the situation. He was tasked with bringing medical supplies to the injured. So, he took them, and when he got there, he placed the supplies down, which accidentally set off a domino chain, which caused a fire and burnt down the entire church, killing everyone inside. He was scorned, hated by the townspeople, treated with nothing but vitriol. You've ruined Overlook! You'd better get out of here! I have to start cleaning up your mess. I lost everyone I loved because of you! You really screwed things up here. You idiot. At no point throughout any of his actions did he have ill intent, but everything he did made the situation worse. And that's the underlying problem Claptrap finds himself in. He's treated like a screw up who ruins everything, because he is, but they never look at what he's trying to do in the first place. Being treated like this genuinely affected him. It made him feel bad, so much so that he had to develop his own denial subroutine to repress his memories. He's constantly living in denial. He rewrites history because if he didn't, the way he's treated would get to him. This is just one incident which is indicative of how he probably always lives his life. He opts in to help because he wants to, but his personality people find annoying, and he always screws the situation up, drawing the scorn of pretty much everyone he crosses paths with. Because Claptrap is a screw-up, he takes a lot of pride in the smaller accomplishments he achieves. During the side mission Ego Trap, we get to see what he considers successes in his life. Things like not annoying anyone, the time one person remembered his birthday. This is before Borderlands 2, so this was before his birthday bash. It makes sense why six people showing up to his party was his biggest success ever, because prior, only one person had ever remembered throughout his lifespan. Other accomplishments include things like the time a stranger smiled at him, and when he opened a door on his first try. These are some of what Claptrap considers to be his proudest moments, and for everyone else, they would consider each of these simple and nothing much to take pride in. In fact, if these were anyone else's accomplishments, they'd probably be pretty depressed, which probably explains why Claptrap is as well. It goes to show how much Claptrap struggles with even just the basics, but also in the side mission we learn just why his so-called friends are always putting him down. It turns out Claptrap has an easily inflated ego, so if he's praised too often, it'll get to his head and he'll develop a holier-than-thou mentality that needs to be popped. And I think that's what really separates people like the Crimson Raiders to the average citizen who hates Claptrap and why he considers these people his friends. With the Raiders, there's no true sense of vitriol or hatred. They put him down keeping his ego in check, but he's still welcome to be around and help out. If he messes up, they'll roast him for it, but he's never actually pushed away. Everyone else he's tried to help and messed up doing has genuinely shunned him with true disdain, but his friends, they tolerate him. But then there is the true kick in the gut to the entire DLC story. 
Shadow Trap, the antagonist of the DLC, is what Claptrap was supposed to be once Jack installed the Vault Hunter.exe programming into him. But Claptrap's insecurity protocols took him for malware and locked him in quarantine. Shadow Trap's ambition is to merge with Claptrap, integrate with the H Source, and take revenge on their enemies. Unlike Claptrap, Shadow Trap recognizes and acknowledges how others treat him, the false friends that he has made, and the deceptive and hostile nature others act towards him. So he delves deeper and deeper into Claptrap's mind in hopes to integrate with him and become one. On the journey, however, the Vault Hunters do wind up taking things too far with Claptrap. They wind up treating him the same way others have in the past. Despite his intentions, they get angry with him, which results in Claptrap venting his frustrations before storming off. Everyone is always so mean! All I've ever done is try to help. I know I mess up, and I've said it up power 100, I'm sorry about it. But if you can't see that, and can't take my good intentions for what they are, then maybe you don't deserve anything good to ever happen to you. In fact, I'm out of here. Ah, I can't leave. I live here. But I can leave you. Claptrap. I'm sorry. With a reaction like that, you'd expect him to turn to Shadow Trap's side. Screw all of these people who are always being mean to me. I'm exacting revenge on humanity. Again. But he doesn't. When all that's separating him from revenge is a simple high five which he loves to do, Claptrap refuses with the only reason being because the characters are his friends. But why not betray these assholes? They exhibit no kindness for you. They would sell you out in a millicycle. Because they're my friends. And so he, along with the Vault Hunters, all fight Shadow Trap together and defeat him. The even more tragic side to what Claptrap did here was that Shadow Trap was right. With Claptrap choosing to believe in his supposed friends, Jack gets his hands on the H Source and goes on to completely destroy every Claptrap unit in existence, and the friends he stood by shot him and left him for dead. Now, not all of them had the same psychopathic optimism, but from Claptrap's perspective, he made the wrong choice. His entire product line was wiped out because of him. There are no other units still operable because of him. And when his body is dumped in Windshear Waste, Hammerlock rescues him. And that's why he has such a best friend mentality towards him in Borderlands 2. Hammerlock also doesn't like him, finds him annoying, but he saved his life, fixed him back to working order. Is he just supposed to ignore him? The pre-sequel really gave us such an in-depth look into Claptrap, what he's always forced to endure being himself and messing up, his willingness to stand by his friends because he doesn't want harm to come to them. He likes to make jokes, he often has a very carefree attitude regardless of the situation, but the struggles he has and the heart that accompanies it make him a very real character. But things don't just end there. We actually have to return back to Borderlands 1 because there was a comic series released in 2015 named The Fall of Firestone and Tannis and the Vault. These comics serve as a more narrative retelling for most of the first game. The series was cancelled and never got the chance to finish, so things only go so far. The general plot of everything remains largely the same aside from the big changes. Roland, Lilith, Mordecai, and Brick arrive as the merry band of Vault Hunters who wind up saving Firestone and working together to collect the fragments of the Vault Key, all while killing a bunch of bandits in the process. The biggest change in the story comes in the form of a new character named Asha. While she would, theoretically, have a much larger role in the story as she's an unexpected siren unique to this comic, she also serves as an important character and motivator for Claptrap and his origin. We all know Claptrap was stationed in Firestone during the original game, but that never quite went further than that, probably because it wasn't supposed to at the time. But in this story, they were able to use this new character to better give Claptrap a more meaningful backstory. 
Asha was the one originally hired to greet new Vault Hunters whenever they came to the planet. When she first came to Pandora, she was hired by Marcus to greet the new travelers whenever they were dropped off at Firestone. Claptrap being in the area and looking to make any new friend, as per usual with him, began talking with her. But unlike the typical response he would get, she indulged in his hobbies. She loved to dance with him, listen to him sing, play bunkers and badasses on occasion. She became a real friend of his. As such, much of Claptrap's time was spent with her at her outpost while she was greeting new travelers. But when bandit activity began increasing, Ninetoes, the infamous bandit leader with three balls, sent a decoy bus filled with explosives and detonated it. Asha was hit with a piece of shrapnel and fell into a coma, while Claptrap only survived because he was a robot with a slightly more durable body. The day after the incident, when Asha didn't wake up, Claptrap decided to cover her shift for her in the meantime, because somebody had to be there to greet new travelers. He decided to keep her post until she eventually woke up. But days passed, and those days turned to months, and eventually Vault Hunters stopped coming to the planet. Claptrap waited there, with no one by his side, for people who never arrived. The only thing that kept him going was his own sense of purpose to do right by a friend. But despite the isolation, he was always ready and prepared to greet anyone who showed up when they did. And you know what? He was prepared, because he was there when the original Vault Hunters came through. They were the first group he'd seen in quite a while, and I'd say he successfully did his job. If that wasn't already heartwarming enough, in the series, he's also much more aware of how others perceive him. There's been some nods every now and then that allude to Claptrap being aware that he can be annoying, but we've never really known his outlook on it. We all know other people find him annoying, but he always continues to be himself, never acknowledging what he thinks about it all. But in the comic, he approaches Lilith and asks her about it. Of course, at this time, the two don't really know each other, so she's not able to say one way or the other, but she does allow Claptrap to indulge in sharing his story. He says how it's hard for him to make friends, which is why Asha wound up being so important to him. He divulges his entire backstory and what happened to her, as well as why he does what he does greeting travelers. Reminiscing about how excited it makes him to greet new people puts him in a dancing mood, and while Lilith tries to abstain, she chooses to share a little dance with Claptrap, because she can tell he's bummed himself out a bit, and he and Asha used to dance a lot. It's a nice little moment between these two characters, and does a lot for both of them. Lilith finds it embarrassing and doesn't want anyone to ever know she did it, but she did. It shows that she's a good person, and helps hammer home why Claptrap would consider these new people his friends. But it doesn't just end there. Later on in the story, he and the others wind up visiting Tannis as they need her assistance. They're promptly given a map and sent on their way so she doesn't have to talk to them. But Claptrap chooses to stay and check in on Asha, who she's been taking care of in the meantime. As we know, Tannis is not a very social individual. She hates conversing with other living beings, and she's developed a very brash and cold personality due to her history on Pandora. Claptrap thinks he's more welcome to be here because he's not technically a person, which of course isn't true in the case of Tannis. She prefers inanimate objects whose feelings can't be hurt because she seems to accidentally do that a lot. In fact, she winds up overstepping her bounds when she insults Claptrap for believing a miracle is possible to reawaken Asha. She says that being an artificial intelligence, he shouldn't believe in feeble-minded things like magic. This hurts Claptrap's feelings, and he runs away, saying how she makes everything horrible and that he hates her. Things eventually calm down, and Claptrap asks how Tannis ended up the way that she did. He wants to know what happened to her on Pandora since she never talks about it, and she seems devoid of humor and emotions. Claptrap even compares the way she speaks to sounding more like Ninetoes than a normal human being. In response, Tannis gives Claptrap the daily recordings of what happened to her over the course of the 520 days when she first arrived on the planet. Claptrap gets to hear Tannis' entire journey with Dahl, the death of her whole research team, and the subsequent trauma that came with the isolation of being alone. Through this, he's able to understand so much more and sympathize with what she's gone through because he knows exactly what it's like being alone. So once he's finished listening to them all, he goes up to her, apologizes, and gives her a hug. 
Even in hindsight, Claptrap and Tannis have a lot in common, the lack of friends and isolation being the two most common. The only difference is Tannis chooses it by choice, while Claptrap experiences it by accident. Regardless, it's a nice moment for Claptrap to be real for a second. His typical attitude isn't necessary, and he instead chooses to console. I'd imagine the two never talk about it again in the comic, which makes sense because as the story goes on, Claptrap literally gets killed. Yeah, at the end of the story when they're fighting the Rack Hive, Claptrap is torn to smithereens and the characters are incapable of saving him. But if there's one thing it leaves on a good note is Marcus, Scooter, and Asha all genuinely grieve over his death. Marcus even sheds a tear, if you can believe that. And in memoriam, they do the only thing that makes logical sense. Dance one last time in memory of Claptrap. I do really love Claptrap's origin here, because it makes such a simple concept as standing in one place ready to greet people so tragic. I mean, Claptrap units are supposed to do things like this, so the idea of one doing it without anyone even being aware aside from the unit itself is very heartfelt. Like I said, the comic was discontinued, so the story never got to see a proper ending. It doesn't matter much, because it's not canon, but it deserves its own appreciation. As for Borderlands 3, it doesn't do anything too crazy with Claptrap. It more or less does what you'd expect from his character by this point. He tasks the Vault Hunters to collect dead Claptrap parts, which perhaps not all players have done. The reason he does this is because, per usual, he's lonely and decides to build himself a girlfriend. You go around the various planets across the galaxy collecting unique components, and once all of the parts are collected, we are introduced to Veronica. But with her new life, she ditches Claptrap and spends her time at Moxie's bar. This higher cognitive function module, you're finally complete, Veronica. How do you feel? It's like coming out of a dark place. I can finally say without question, I am. And on a related note, I am sick of your stupid face, Claptrap. Spending all this time building a companion bot? Well, too bad for you, bucko, because I'm a strong, independent woman and I don't need no preeny little boy that crap in my ample style! What? No, but... but I... We, we were supposed to be together! Keep dreaming, scrap heap! <laughs> Perhaps one of his better moments in the game, however, involves a character named Baby. She's a woman who put out an ad long ago looking for a dance partner and only now has Claptrap found it and taken the job. It's the easiest payday he could possibly imagine. But when we arrive at the house, we see that she's now in a wheelchair and has lost all hope of ever dancing again. But Claptrap shows her that you can still dance even with just wheels. I really needed that. Next time, don't take so long to come see me, okay? You're not getting rid of me that easy. We're just getting started. It's a nice little side mission which showcases Claptrap's optimism being used for something nice. The final thing I'll bring up is Hammerlock's wedding. Claptrap wasn't given an invitation, but he wouldn't miss it for the world. He owes so much to his friend. Hammerlock, however, doesn't want him to ruin anything, and so Gage sends him on this wild goose chase to obtain the Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge, which, as far as she's aware, she made up. But you know what winds up happening? He finds it. Claptrap goes on an actual journey through haunted shipwrecks, battling wizards, being trapped in an alternate dimension, all because he believes attaining this pearl will save the wedding. 
It's quite literally the only time him wanting to help worked and he didn't ruin anything. At least he didn't ruin anything for the people he was trying to help. There's no saying how much chaos he caused on his journey. Unfortunately, there was no genuine need for this, so his actions were kind of pointless. But nonetheless, when analyzing his character, that's quite a milestone for him. He's starting to be able to get things done and help out without doing more harm than good. Claptrap is one of Borderlands' most underrated characters. He, time and time again, is put through these heartfelt and sad moments that if you just take a moment to stop and look at, you find it quite hard to actually hate his character as much as those in-universe tend to. At the end of the day, Claptrap is someone who's just looking to make friends but has a hard time doing it. He knows that he can be annoying, he knows that he messes things up a lot, but he never stops trying. While those around him put him down, they only do so enough so he doesn't get an inflated ego. I just wanted to shine some light and show some appreciation for the iconic little door opener we know and love. He's the epitome of the franchise and represents what Borderlands is all about. So next time Claptrap asks you for a high five or wants you to dance with him, indulge. Because he really is just looking to make as many friends as possible. And isn't that what playing Borderlands is about?